Um, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to offer a very warm welcome to this uh, policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center in cooperation with the US mission to the EU. It's part of our Transatlantic Challenges series. Uh, the topic of today's meeting is enhancing resilience and security in Eastern Europe. A stable and resilient Eastern Europe is what I would actually call the Eastern Partnership region. Um, is crucial to Euro-Atlantic security and stability. Hence, the ability of the region's countries to be resilient to both internal and external threats is extremely important. All the countries in this region face serious external and internal challenges that impact on their security, including their economic security. This includes, for example, the fight against corruption, the rule of law, disinformation, warfare, and most recently, I would say the COVID-19 pandemic, which actually revealed the fragility of many of the healthcare systems in the region. And of course, when we look at the external challenges, um, there's Russia. Um, no need to say any more on that. Um, so I'm delighted um, that we have a really excellent panel um, of speakers here today, both officials and experts, um, to address this topic. I'm going to briefly introduce them. Um, first of all, we're very delighted to have with us Ambassador Philip uh, T. Rika from the Bureau of European and Euro-Asian Affairs in the US State Department. Welcome to you, um, Ambassador. Um, from the European External Action Service, we have Richard Tibbles, who's Head of Division for Eastern Partnership Bilateral Relations. Uh, we have Luke Kofi, who is Director of the Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation, uh, and a well-known expert uh, on the whole Eastern Partnership um, region. Uh, Veronica Movshan, Academic Director at the Institute for Economic Research and Policy Consulting in Kiev. And last but certainly not least, we have Richard Girigosian, um, who's Director of the Regional Center uh, for Studies in Yerevan, um, Armenia. So I'd like to welcome all of you to this event. Um, just before we start with the uh, interventions, um, I would just like to remind the audience that they can ask a question either by typing it into the dialogue box that you can see on your screen or by clicking on the hand that should be next to your name. I would really encourage you uh, to do this early on so that we don't have a, a huge you know, battle at the end of putting forward questions. And I would also appreciate it if it's possible for you to say which speaker you would address your, um, your question to. This makes it um, easier for me. Um, so I'd like to kick off um, this by asking um, Ambassador uh, Rika uh, to kick us off. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you for organizing this forum. Uh, these days, uh, indeed, are, are challenging times for all of us during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but it's so important, uh, certainly in the field of diplomacy, uh, international relations that we maintain these kinds of engagements and thanks to the technology uh, that's made it possible. I do wish I were able to say good afternoon to you in, in, in Brussels, but I'll say good morning uh, from Washington. I um, think certainly uh, uh, make us realize uh, in, in Eastern Europe uh, how important uh, this kind of engagement is that we keep a focus uh, on the region. Uh, the United States, of course, um, has uh, has had a long uh, and positive relationship uh, with Eastern Europe going back to really the founding of, of our country. Uh, but the last 30 years have been particularly insightful. My own career has focused very much on Eastern and Central Europe, the changes there. And as we uh, commemorate the anniversaries, the 30th anniversary of uh, 1989, 90, 91, all of the changes and developments, uh, it's important to take stock of uh, where we are and of course, think about the security challenges that the region face, faces. Uh, you made it uh, clear we all realize uh, that there is no bigger threat in Eastern Europe than Russia. Uh, it's an unfortunate reality that we had hoped uh, might be different uh, as we sought to engage Russia in a more positive way. Uh, we've seen that Russia seeks to undermine its neighbor's uh, political independence, uh, has continuously engaged in, in malign behavior. Uh, such as assassinations, uh, disinformation, campaigns, and, and malicious cyber attacks. Uh, many in the region have experienced that. 
they continue to uh, to lead and arm and, and train proxy forces uh, in eastern Ukraine, including with, with banned heavy weapons, I would add, violating um, with impunity the promises they made in the Minsk agreements. Uh, Russia really needs to be held accountable in, in international um, for of to the commitments they've made and accept responsibility for their actions. Uh, we've seen, of course, uh, the uh, announcement from Berlin confirming Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was poisoned by a nerve agent. Uh, that's an absolutely shocking development confirmed, I see today, by Sweden and France. Uh, and again, any use of chemical weapons is uh, anywhere, uh, anytime is um, uh, under any circumstances uh, unacceptable and contravenes uh, international norms prohibiting the use of, of such weapons. So we've been urging Russia uh, to cooperate fully with the international community's investigation into the latest uh, attack and those responsible, both those who committed the attack and, and those who ordered it uh, should be held accountable and we'll be looking to the OPCW and others uh, uh, to be a part of that. In Belarus, of course, we've seen over the weekend increasing brutality again, and yet uh, inspiring courage on the part of the Belarusian people. Uh, we have uh, remained deeply concerned about the fraudulent election of August the 9th. Uh, we've strongly condemned, again, the violence, uh, as well as the uh, detention of, uh, of peaceful protesters, the arrest of opposition candidates, the blockage of internet service, uh, the abuse of detainees, and we've been demanding the immediate release of uh, those unjustly detained, which includes U.S. citizens, uh, and accounted, accounting for those uh, reported missing. Um, at the same time, as I said, we've been really inspired by the peaceful displays of uh, protests by Belarusians who are simply seeking a government that delivers for them uh, we stand by Belarus's sovereignty, its independence, and the opportunity for the Belarusian people to, uh, to have a government that uh, meets their needs, uh, addresses what they want, and is elected uh, in a free, fair uh, manner. Um, as Secretary Pompeo has said, uh, and Deputy Secretary Began, who has uh, visited in the region very recently, we continue to urge the leadership in Belarus to engage with civil society, uh, including the, the National Coordination Council. Uh, instead of uh, ejecting people from the country or, or rounding them up and detaining them, they should engage and have a conversation in a manner that, demand, that meets the demands of the Belarusian people. Uh, and we're committed to close coordination with, with like-minded allies. We've had conversations with the EU, uh, the UK, uh, and many others who have been uh, actively involved. Uh, my deputy assistant secretary for the region, George Kent, uh, is, is leading our team here, but with Secretary Began and uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, monitoring this extremely closely. I do want to make sure we, we note that it's uh, six and a half years uh, that uh, Russia, uh, six and a half years ago that Russia illegally seized Crimea and their authorities there continue an abusive occupation of the peninsula, silencing critics and uh, severely curtailing media, uh, religious freedoms, militarizing the peninsula, which, uh, which threatens common security in the Black Sea and beyond. Uh, recall the, the Crimea Declaration of July 2018, where the United States has made clear we do not and will not ever recognize Russia's claims of sovereignty over the peninsula. Crimea is Ukraine. And uh, we want to make clear we continue to uh, condemn uh, Russia's actions there. We can certainly spend a lot of time on Russia, but uh, we should not ignore uh, the People's Republic of China, where the Chinese Communist Party remains a significant, significant threat to uh, global democracies uh, with campaigns of, of purposeful coercion and control, uh, debt diplomacy, uh, and a drive to uh, control people and information and, and economies. Uh, it's really not a matter uh, of suggesting that any European countries, those in Eastern Europe included, uh, need to choose between uh, the United States and China. That's 
been uh, shaped as, as a narrative, that's a false uh, equivalency. Um, in effect, we all have to find uh, uh, a way to work with China. Uh, there are opportunities, but there are also great challenges. We need to focus on reciprocity, respect for international norms and the rules-based order, uh, and take actions accordingly uh, to, uh, to work with China. Uh, clearly, our competitors, whether it's Russia or China, have an alternate vision for the future, including in the Eastern European region. Uh, and they have uh, taken issue uh, with our efforts to, uh, to engage. Uh, we want to work with our partners in the transatlantic community, uh, including NATO and the European Union. Um, and in Eastern Europe, work together to really defend the freedoms that uh, the people of the region fought for and earned uh, 30 years ago. So I'll leave it at that as, as just an intro and really look forward to uh, the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Rika. Before we move on, maybe I could just ask you perhaps um, to elaborate on some of the internal challenges that some of the countries in the region um, are facing, because most of these countries um, face serious challenges from deeply embedded, let's say, oligarchs or corruption, vested interests. I mean, what do you make of the efforts that have been taken um, by a number of these countries to turn the situation around? And maybe you could also add the sort of support that the that the US has been given um, through in, in other initiatives to help build internal um, resilience. Well, I'm glad you raise it because uh, for th most of 30 years, we've had uh, a very uh, robust program of uh, support and assistance to uh, help provide uh, not only resilience, but reform and underscored that through our diplomacy and uh, USAID programs, working with so many uh, partners, uh, not just from the United States, but uh, across the West. Uh, we've seen great strides in Eastern Europe, if you think back to uh, where we were 30 years ago, but the challenges remain. And indeed, uh, uh, the network of oligarchs, uh, the stifled economies, corruption being uh, such a problem. You see this uh, in Ukraine, where we pushed for uh, reform and, uh, and continue to have uh, extremely uh, uh, important programs working with international partners to try to help uh, Ukraine. Uh, you've seen President Zelensky come into power, the Ukrainian people looking for uh, a new direction. Uh, but this is a, a long-term challenge, and you see it uh, obviously in Belarus. The people uh, in Belarus are in the streets uh, not because uh, they're being motivated by, by foreigners, they're speaking for themselves. And in fact, uh, uh, Belarusian uh, opposition figures have made very clear what they want is support for Belarus's sovereignty uh, and to have the kind of dialogue that will let them make changes uh, in, in that country. Uh, the coronavirus, uh, the economic challenges have not made this uh, any easier. I don't want to forget, we haven't mentioned uh, Moldova, uh, another country that um, will have uh, uh, elections uh, very soon. Um, and uh, Georgia, of course, uh, those countries in the Caucasus uh, have made great strides in, in many ways, but face uh, real problems, including regional conflicts. And the U.S. has remained uh, extremely engaged uh, through a variety of structures and processes to, uh, to try to help resolve those conflicts uh, peacefully. That uh, continues. Our commitment there continues. It doesn't get nearly as much attention as I believe uh, it deserves given everything else going on in the world, but we're grateful for uh, partners uh, in the NGO community and think tanks, uh, folks like Luke at, at Heritage, who uh, continue to call attention to these developments and, uh, and work with our partners in the EU uh, and other places uh, to stand by as, as friends and partners. Uh, that's our um, goal uh, for the region. Obviously, our interest is to uh, to see stability, uh, which will lead to increasing prosperity uh, for the for those uh, countries and their peoples, and, and that's what um, what successive U.S. administrations have stood for. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. I'm sure we will be back with you with many questions in the in the discussion.
Um, I'd now like to turn to um, Richard Tibbles. Um, I remember when the global strategy first came out, this is where resilience first, first was, was cited. It became a sort of buzzword after that around this town um, and elsewhere. I'd be interested to hear from you. I mean, within the framework of Eastern Partnership, particularly um, the key tools and, and successes um, in terms of helping um, build resilience in the region, and where have been, you know, the key the key challenges and, and failures, so to speak. Thanks very much, Amanda. You you took the word out of my mouth when you mentioned the uh, global strategy, because that's where I was going to start with the uh, resilience of our neighbours to the east and south was highlighted in the EU Global Strategy in 2015 as one of the key uh, drivers of our external action going forward and it has remained so to this day and it will go uh, on uh, being so in the future and that's highlighted in the Eastern Partnership communication that we issued in March which I'll come back to talk to uh, at the end. Um, resilience is very much the buzzword as, as you said I was speaking to one of the representatives of our partner countries uh, only uh, uh, Friday, and she was saying how difficult it is to translate into other languages. Um, so it is an issue <laughs> to use this term. I, I think we know exactly what we mean, uh, but explaining this to our partner countries is something that we should uh, pay attention to. Um, one definition is, that it is the ability of states and societies to anticipate and adjust to pressures uh, while maintaining social and political cohesion and without undermining core human rights and democratic principles. And those pressures obviously can be long-term ones such as demography, resource scarcity or geopolitical uncertainties, as well as uh, short-term uh, shocks and crises. Um, and as you rightly said, Amanda, um, challenges can come from both within uh, and uh, without and uh, Phil has uh, eloquently described one of the big challenges from without uh, shall we say. Um, it is of course at first and foremost the responsibility of states to uh, look after their own uh, resilience and to take care of the uh, needs of their own populations but Certainly, uh, when uh, the EU produced its joint communication on a strategic approach to resilience uh, in 2017, we identified the EU as being uh, a key supporter of states' efforts to strengthen uh, their own uh, resilience. Because, very uh, selfishly, we regarded that as one of the uh, drivers of ensuring uh, both economic uh, prosperity and uh, better uh, security in a contested and uh, complex uh, world. And uh, in the uh, security uh, area, it was clear that um, resi tackling resilience included hybrid threats, uh, strengthening cyber security, strengthening critical infrastructure, security, countering terrorism and violent, violent extremism. But I think the first point that I want to make is that uh, resilience is a much broader concept. Uh, involving uh, all individuals and all of society and that a resilient society would have as some of its features a stable democracy, uh, trust and accountability uh, in its institutions and a sustainable and inclusive economic uh, uh, development. And those are the things we're certainly trying to push in the uh, eastern uh, neighbourhood uh, with a, with, through the Eastern Partnership, uh, six partners which are all very uh, different. Um, there is, to a certain extent, a common challenge from uh, uh, ex, a ex, common external challenge in a number of cases where where um, the in, uh, territorial integrity of our partners has been uh, challenged by by Russia. Uh, but there are also internal challenges, um, as uh, you've said, Amanda, and. What I wanted to do was just pick a, a few examples of what we do in the Eastern Partners to illustrate the breadth of the resilience concept and the fact that everything the EU does in support of our Eastern Partners is one way or another related to the goal of strengthening um, the ability of countries to look after themselves. Um, in Georgia, therefore, uh, we have a multifaceted program which pulls together support for interventions across the security sector, cyber sector, countering hybrid threats, that's called our SAFE uh, uh, program. 
In Moldova, uh, Phil has mentioned some of the is issues relating to Moldova. We are looking to strengthen uh, civil society and independent media because that's certainly um, uh, an area which provides uh, uh, outlets uh, for alternative views and in the, at the end of the day can create that trust in reliable uh, institutions. In Armenia, I think our, our basic agreement, the SEPA agreement with Armenia, in, is in a certain sense a, a reflection of our goal of resilience. Um, we can develop a, a wide range of uh, cooperation with a country of the Eastern Partnership, which nevertheless has a trade and security relationship with Russia through the, uh, the uh, Eurasian Economic Union and uh, CSTO. And we are particularly supporting uh, the reform agenda of the new government uh, as uh, Mr. Pashinyan uh, tries to find this uh, uh, narrow path between uh, uh, furthering democracy in his country whilst remaining uh, uh, loyal to its um, uh, uh, strategic and military uh, alliances. And we're helping in particular in the justice area, this is an area where uh, the EU is coming in strong in Armenia to support the kind of rule of law reforms that uh, the government is uh, pursuing. In Azerbaijan, I would say that our big contribution to the resilience of Azerbaijan is trying to encourage uh, economic diversification away from uh, oil and gas towards uh, other sectors of the economy. I think uh, that is the uh, best way in which the EU can support the long term uh, resilience of uh, Azerbaijan. We are looking to conclude a new uh, framework agreement with uh, with Azerbaijan, which would um, uh, help us uh, take that cooperation another step uh, forward. Um, on Ukraine, of course, uh, a lot of our work is done to uh, support Ukraine uh, faced with uh, the conflict uh, in the east. We are undertaking a lot of work to uh, support the uh, vulnerable communities in the non-governmental governmental control areas. We're doing a lot of work on the government uh, controlled area side uh, as well, partly to demonstrate the attractiveness of uh, a democratic rule of law Ukraine to all of the uh, citizens of Ukraine. And of course, let me, let me highlight our work through the trilateral talks uh, in, uh, in previous years to enhance uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, energy uh, uh, independence um, as a key uh, element of uh, Ukraine's resilience going, going forward. On uh, Belarus, how can I put it, our resilience efforts are work in progress, of course. Um, you know, uh, I won't repeat our kind of political line. Uh, we, we with the US, I think, see very much eye to eye on the situation there. This is completely about Belarusian citizens wanting to uh, um, have a leadership which respects their votes and protects their basic uh, human rights. This is nothing about a geopolitical competition um, and we hope that all partners east and west of Belarus uh, look at the situation in the, in the same way. But we have been trying to support um, mobility exchanges with uh, young people in uh, in Belarus as one of the things that can uh, really set down the roots for a more uh, vibrant, diverse uh, Belarus in the future. Um, let me move on to a point that you mentioned, uh, Amanda, about uh, COVID. Um, this has indeed raised new resilience challenges for uh, all of us uh, and including our Eastern partners. And uh, we are uh, trying uh, to support, uh, in particular, the SME sector of the economy, uh, which is going to be necessary as we pull out of the uh, um, uh, COVID uh, uh, crisis. And I must say, we have discovered, to our regret, that disinformation can take place also in the context of the COVID crisis, and we've been stressing uh, to all concerned the importance of correctly reflecting uh, who is providing uh, real uh, support to our partner countries to tackle uh, the uh, COVID pandemic. So looking forward, we are now uh, looking to uh, the Eastern Partnership Summit next year, based, we hope, on the ideas contained in the joint communication of Mar March of this year, 
you will have seen that the overall policy objective of this communication is indeed strengthening resilience of our Eastern partners. And you can't really get away from the word resilient. Uh, on, it's on every page of the, of the, uh, of the communication. Resilient, sustainable and, and integrated economies, accountable institutions, rule of law, security, uh, environmental and climate resilience, resilient digital transformation and resilient, fair and inclusive societies. And that really demonstrates the notion of resilience in the EU sense is that all of our action across all sectors, uh, democracy development, people-to-people uh, -people contacts, economy, energy, security, environment, health, all of these play a role in, in, in helping the countries stand on their own two feet, tackle challenges both from within and uh, uh, without. And, and certainly I think um, we are very much looking forward to working with our Eastern partners as the EU comes out of the COVID crisis itself. You've heard the term uh, build back better, and that's certainly what we want to try and do, building our partner countries into this endeavor uh, as, we, as we move forward in the green transition, the digital transformation, and ensure that as we build back our economies, we take everyone uh, with us, uh, young people uh, in a gender equal way, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we will obviously be looking to increase our support uh, to uh, the health sectors of our partner countries. This is not an area that we've concentrated on before, but it's certainly one of the uh, things that we're going to be doing uh, in the future. Uh, maybe a final point. Um, uh, the resilience of our partner countries cannot succeed if it's not based on respect for the rule of law and uh, uh, good governance. So I think this remains uh, um, as we look towards some of the more attractive areas of green and digital development in the future, I think we will want to underpin our cooperation with a concentration on uh, rule of law, good governance, tackling corruption, since without those things, um, um, countries will not be resilient in, in the long term. Thanks very much, Amanda. Thank you very much, Richard, for this very good, I think, um, overview of what the Eastern Partnership or what the EU is doing to help support um, resilience in the Eastern Partnership countries. I'm sure there'll be many questions for you in, in the discussion. Um, I'd like to turn now to um, Veronica from Ukraine. I always call Ukraine uh, the promised land um, because I think Ukraine is a country that has a huge amount of promise, um, but most of that promise has not yet been delivered. Um, including in terms of economic promise. I mean, you're an expert on Ukraine's um, economy, so it would be great to hear from you um, where you think the key you know, challenges continue to be in terms of building um, a resilient economic situation in Ukraine. I mean, we know that there have been dec decades of vested interests and corrupt leaders, you know, corrupt oligarchs, you know, corrupt networks. Um, so to what degree are these being, you know, pushed back or do they still remain a significant challenge um, in Ukraine? Uh, thank you. My pleasure to participate in this discussion and the questions you posed are extremely interesting and extremely difficult to answer. Uh, basically, uh, the answer is uh, Ukraine is in motion. I would say that over the last five, six years, the country did a lot to increase its resilience and economic resilience and push back on things that you described to that as the dominance of oligarchs, the very unflexible economy, uh, etc. But a lot remained. Why I said that uh, the things are better, for example, the COVID crisis, uh, we saw in the first month that the huge lockdown and significant shocks, uh, the Ukraine still have been demonstrating or had been demonstrating stable national currency, low inflation, no panic on the banking market. Actually, the banking system has not been considered as a source for crisis anymore. In all our previous economic shocks Ukraine had, the banking system was one of the major troubling spots. Currently, thanks to the support of reforms, the push of reforms of our international partners, the EU, the US, the 
the National Monetary Fund, other international donors. Uh, the reform of the banking system has been one of the major uh, tasks and one of the few the completed tasks or mostly completed tasks in the country. And this is one of the great examples how the joint effort and the ongoing support on the one hand and ongoing push for reforms on the other hand is important. But regretfully, it's, we don't have only positive cases. We have uh, very problematic cases, for example, the fundamental issue of rule of law and fight with corruption. I would say that it's uh, it's an it cannot be considered separately. You cannot have a successful fight with corruption if you have no rule of law. In it. And here, despite a lot of support, despite a lot of reforms, basically I can say now that the situation is in a stalemate at best and we have now the situation then the uh, national anti-corruption bureau accused one of the key uh, uh, courts and the leading judges in this court in the system for widespread corruption and the system court system itself the self-regulatory court board they said no you cannot touch them and uh, currently, I, I'm not lawyer, it would be interesting to, to hear the comments and recommendations, what has and can be done. But it shows that this uh, resilience has been built in Ukraine to some extent, and we are still the country of promise more than the country of the full success cases. But talking about other aspects of resilience, rem Talking about Russia, for example, that was uh, mentioned by Mr. Ambassador, and it's generally it's hard to speak about region resilience without remembering or recalling Russia. I think that this uh, Russia has to be considered in the like the Hotomivis Association Agreement and partnership with European Union, because one of the major uh, impacts how Ukraine was able to overcome the impact of Russian basically blackmailing, economic blackmailing, was the support of the European Union. On the gas market, we have already mentioned these uh, uh, trilateral talks, but more importantly, Ukraine became a member of the energy community, and then Ukraine managed under these commitments of the energy community and within the association agreement managed to converge its legislation with the European legislation that allowed changing the uh, rules of the game on the market. It allowed signing the agreement with Russia based on the European norms. This is a completely different structure, uh, different rules and norms of the game that we have here and this is very important and here is the role of um, the European Union cannot be underestimated. In general, association agreement the DCFT allowed um, sustaining the shock from the collapse of trade with Russia because Russia closed, uh, closed withdraw free trade agreement with Ukraine as soon as the DCFT entered into force. But thanks to the CFTA, it's not only opening of the EU market. Regulator converges increased Ukrainian resilience globally. Now Ukrainian businesses can sell to third countries, to Arab world, to China, to others, claiming, trustfully claiming that Ukrainian standards and uh, safety rules are in line with European, which are one of the most sophisticated. This is it's helping to increase resilience of the country and it is the international support uh one more thing uh, one more thing that was mentioned here it's uh support for civil society organizations i represent think tank i would not be able to omit this topic uh, i think that the very important that the United States, the European Union, work not only with the government, not only with authorities. They are uh, tackling uh, the support, the capacity building, empowering 
civil society organizations because with very like young democracy in the country with uh, very strong russian influences the strong civil society including strong think tanks is one of the key aspects for the uh, societal res uh, resilience i would say and okay uh, i we have also a lot of issues for security i am not a war expert it's hard to discuss but uh, support with trainings as uh, involvement in much closer cooperation with nato uh, support with the weapon and definitely support with mitigating the impact of social and humanitarian impacts of the war are all the things that on which ukraine relies on partners and together with them it develops its own resilience because uh, the security in the region is not a task for the one single country it's impossible to be a task in one single country it's a task for mutual efforts and probably one last and not least in its infrastructure because when we are talking about security it's important to remember for safety of for example azov and black sea and especially i would say here black sea because we are all thinking that how abusive russia is in azov sea which is de facto blocked but basically for ukrainian resilience for economic resilience but for whole security it's important to assure that black sea is not blocked for ukraine uh, and for actually for other countries but i'm talking for ukraine and i know that uh, there are international efforts uh, military non-military to ensure this security there and it's one another component and i didn't mention uh, a green deal which is important a digital union which ukraine wants to be a part of the european so many aspects where ukraine is actually interlinking with the eu uh, cooperating actively with the us and by that it becomes a partner of something larger and as a result it becomes much more resilient than if it stands alone in front of russia and uh, then it would not be able to fight thank you Thank you, Veronica. I have to say I can't um, resist to ask you, how do you assess the leadership of um, President Zelensky um, so far in terms of building up the resilience um, of Ukraine? I mean, he has a lot, lots of pluses and minuses, I think, it's seen, but I'd be interested to hear your, your um, views on this. Um. I'm afraid I would be more pessimistic than optimistic. Uh, uh, Mr. Zelensky, the, he was elected fully democratically. That's, that's a huge plus. Uh, but uh, I would not say that we have stronger resilience with him. Uh, let's turn into the topics that I mentioned. For example, the, the peace process on Donbass uh, here is almost, it's my like very very personal and completely non-expert judgment but I, I don't feel safer now I don't feel that the developments with the aim of the peace at any price the aim of the peace then the people are dying with the very bad stories happening is is feasible I suspect that his policy then he's not listening to the whole society is uh, creating much more dividing lines than uh, the real uniting lines peace topic of donbass reintegration of donbass is extremely difficult it's, it's important to have a dialogue and i'm afraid that mr Zelensky is not uh, in favor of any dialogues he is more like showman rather than the politician who is trying to find balances at least it's my impression Economy is also a very bad uh, situation because we have uh, changes in the government. I would not say that the new government is stable, and we had absolutely disastrous change in national bank head. So far, we don't see the major change in the policy at the macro level, but basically, uh, the most of uh, people who were in the previous 
board of the National Bank have been left. We have out of seven, only two remained. And uh, I don't know what will be the policy of the National Bank, especially even not towards macroeconomic stability, also it's also important, but it's also towards uh, these cases with private bank and banking regulation and cases with the fraud, how persistent it will be. I don't know. And it's interesting that Ukraine is in the budget envisages much higher inflation for next year than for this year. It's, now we have about 3% of like that. Now we for next year we plan 7.3. That means that uh, we will expect much higher um, inflationary tax. It's not huge, but it's uh, above the limit that the National Bank targeted. As I said, juridical reform is a complete disaster. The anti-corruption board is, seems to be not very much open, working. Uh, the parliamentary majority seems to be, uh, to say at least, unstable. We have a lot of uh, scandals around individual ministries, and I would not say... We, he did huge positive things. I'm not sure that it was his or it was like successors, but he did land reform. Or he will do it if we see it launched the next year, because we are still in the process of waiting. It's still a lot of time to, to derail it, I pray. But hopefully it will be launched. It's several key important laws were passed, especially the first phase of this turbo regime autumn last year. But since then, I would not say that this momentum has been sustained and the problems uh, have been accumulating. So I'm not very optimistic, but uh, I still have hope I am living here. I want prosperity for my country. Thank you, Veronica. Um, I'm now going to turn to um, Richard Giragosian from Yerevan. Uh, are you there, Richard? Because I can't see you on the screen. Yes, What's I am. Name? I'm invisible. You are. Ah, OK, the invisible man. <laughs> OK, um, so I'm looking forward now to hear your views on, on this topic. I mean, Armenia clearly has faced um, significant um, challenges to its uh, security over the years. Um, but I mean, we've also seen in the two, was it two years ago, um, the, the Velvet Revolution that brought um, Nikol Pashinyan uh, to power with many pro from, you know, uh, entrenched Russian um, interests and also the famous oligarchs that exist in the entire region. So it'd be very interesting to hear your picture on the state of play um, today. In, in Well, thank you very much, Amanda, and it's a pleasure to join the EPC, but also to join such a distinguished panel. And please make no mistake, even though I'm invisible, if you will, the dark days of Armenia have long passed, as you have noted. But specifically, I do have a observation to start with. If we look at enhancing resilience and security, the broader strategic trajectory is very positive. The tide is turning against the age of the autocrat. And what we've seen in Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia in 2018, and now Belarus. What we see is a trajectory of a turning of the tide. And in terms of the Eastern Partnership, I'd like to identify five specific drivers as important factors. The first is empowerment. In terms of empowerment, what we see is already present prerequisites. Activism and civic awakening have replaced fear and apathy. There's little danger of going backwards now. Once this population in Belarus, Georgia, Ukraine, and now Armenia has awakened, there's much more of activism by crucial agents of change. In Belarus today, the agents of change are both gender, a female-led, female-protected opposition wave of demonstrations, but also generational. The demographics at play are crucial. 
This is in Armenia and now Belarus, very much a youth-driven civic awakening. Beyond this first factor of empowerment, the second driver is the United States and the European Union acting and serving as enablers. Enablers in terms of providing the tools for change. For example, realistically, offering a face-saving facilitation of dialogue and de-escalation when and where possible. In terms of this second driver, I would add it's important for Washington and Brussels to understand what not to do as much as what to do. And what I'm talking about is there should be much less tolerance in Washington and Brussels, less tolerance for shortcomings and shortcuts in democratization. And third, beyond empowerment and enabling, is education. And what I'm talking about in terms of education is the necessity to remind the regimes of the cost of resisting demands for change. Reminding the regime of the cost while also reiterating to the population in the Eastern neighborhood the benefits of refusing to surrender. The dividends from democracy need to be reiterated in a more consistent communication strategy. This is an important element of true resilience. And the fourth driver is a word of unique significance from American history, emancipation. And what I'm talking about is emancipation from insecurity based on a foundation of a new social contract where democratic institutions are the foundation for security and statehood, the keys to resilience. And what I'm talking about, to be completely honest, is to understand and recognize that unresolved conflicts remain the unacceptable burden of the past, require strategic vision, statesmanship, and leadership, together with political will that is sorely lacking, especially in the South Caucasus. Unresolved conflicts have become the poisonous legacy, preventing and blocking resiliency in statehood. And to be quite honest, security is no longer an acceptable excuse for shortcomings in public policy and democratization. I have much less tolerance and much more frustration with the excuse for security over real durable democratization. And the fifth final driver I see is engagement. Engagement, especially in terms of US and European Union partnership and patronage. And in terms of engagement, what's important here is for the first time in a very long time, the West has a new field of partners to work with on the ground in the Eastern neighborhood. And both the United States and the EU, to be quite frank, are not the answers to all of our problems on the ground, but rather an important opportunity, an aspiration, and a vision that reiterates the need to aim high, to think big among these rather small, isolated countries of the Eastern Partnership. And in general, there's no longer any alternative but to democratic reform. Authoritarianism is overextended, it's weakened, and it's based on insecurity and a lack of confidence. And in this context from Armenia, which represents a rare victory of nonviolent people power, very rare and difficult to achieve, what Armenia represents almost counterintuitively was a re reaffirmation of European ideals as an endorsement of American values. This needs to re be rewarded. In other words, Armenia in many ways 
is not too big to fail, like Wall Street, but is too small to fail. Meaning that what Armenia's Velvet Revolution stands out as is an inherent threat to the Putin model of authoritarian governance rather than nonviolent people power. And in this context, Armenia as a affirmation of European values needs to be invested in. We cannot afford to fail. Otherwise, it will prove the Russian model is perhaps the winner rather than the correct reading of the tide of history. And in conclusion, it's most important to say there is no conclusion. This is very much a dynamic, ongoing process. In no way is it static, but fortunately, this is an affirmation that we are on the right side of history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, before I turn finally to Luke, I would just like to you know, ask you about the, the relationship today between um, Armenia um, and Russia. Um, would you say that Armenia is less vulnerable um, to Russia pressure than it was um, a few years ago? Well, that's a very good question, if not the only question that matters today. I would admit, as an American who moved to Armenia and chose to live here, I was very surprised that the Russian reaction to the Armenian Velvet Revolution was uncharacteristically passive and permissive. This is a reflection, however, of a deepening of the crisis between Armenia and Russia. Fortunately, the recognition of the dangers and the risk of Armenia's over-dependence on Russia is palpable, it's obvious. What we're trying to do is not find an exit strategy, but rather to mitigate the downside and the risk. Fortunately, we don't have a border with Russia. We're not as vulnerable as other countries, if you will. But we need to maximize our room to maneuver. This is why I must admit the normalization of relations between Armenia and Turkey is one of the few positive potential game changers. To the credit of the European Union and the United States, both are still investing and supporting such efforts. And this is perhaps a positive way to remake the map. But I do think the Pashinyan government in Armenia is under consistent pressure from the Russian Federation. And there is a, a genuine awakening and a recalculation within Armenia among the population that we are benefiting from democracy despite Russia, not because of Russia. And this is important in terms of it's not opening borders, opening minds. And there's much more for us to work with because Russia dangerously takes Armenia for granted. It's the arrogance and the asymmetry of the relationship rather than the relationship itself. That's the challenge. More than that, it's too soon to say. Okay, thank you, um, Richard. I'd now like to turn to our last speaker, um, to Luke. At the same time, I would like to ask the audience, if you have a question, please type it in or please pick on your hand. Um, Luke, you've been covering this region for really a long time. I mean, I've lost count of the amount of your papers I've read and I've, I've referenced um, in my own work. So I'd be really interested to hear from you. I mean, what what you think are the main you know, weaknesses um, and challenges facing this region today? including obviously Russia. I mean, you've written extensively on security in Russia um, and how you think they could be best overcome. Uh, thanks, Amanda, for those kind words. And thanks to EPC for inviting me here to, um, to speak virtually at this event. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear that at least someone reads the stuff that I write. So at least I can mark down one person as, as reading it. <laughs> uh, no, I do appreciate the, those remarks. Um, last year, I attended a uh, tabletop exercise um, at a 
think tank down the street from the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. at the Atlantic Council. And it was based on a hybrid warfare scenario in Lithuania. Um, it had the usual stuff that you would expect in this sort of thing. Cyber attacks, civil unrest, uh, Russian biker gangs, uh, these uh, you know sort of things. After the exercise, though, one thing really stood out. And to me, it was that hybrid warfare is something that has to be prevented or deterred. And this is where the resilience factor comes in. It's not something that can be easily defeated. And in fact, once the uh, social, the political, and the economic conditions exist that allow these hybrid tactics to be so, so successful and effective, it might be too late to stop it. And this is... Um, Touching on what, what Richard said about how um, most of the most of the responsibility for uh, dealing with these hybrid threats actually is at the nation state level. Um, there is a role for the European Union and for NATO, and I'll touch on that in a second. But I do just want to focus on three areas that I believe um, countries have to get right if they want to build resilience against hybrid uh, threats. The first one is good governance. And actually, you need good governance at the local level, the national level, and in the context of the European Union, you need it at the good governance at the intergovernmental and supranational levels. If people feel like that they're governed well and they're governed fairly, then they become less susceptible to Russian uh, malign influence and disinformation. The second area that uh, needs focus is economic freedom. Uh, if people feel like that they, um, have a, they have economic prosperity, if their children have a good economic future, again, they become less susceptible to uh, disinformation and Russian interference. And finally, you need good trust in security services uh, and law enforcement, local law enforcement, national law enforcement bodies, and intelligence gathering services. If people think that they're treated fairly and equally under the law, especially by law enforcement and by intelligence and security services, then again, they become less susceptible to uh, the Russian uh, interference. And these three not only apply to the countries we're talking about today in the Eastern Partnership, but they also apply to um, Western Europe and they apply to the United States uh, as well. I mean, take the last example, on trust in law enforcement and security services. America, of course, is a very divided country right now, politically and socially. And you have two extremes. On, on one side, you have a huge uh, segment of the American population, which uh, with uh, often good justification, feels like that they're um, uh, singled out or mistreated by law enforcement. On the other side uh, of the scale, you have um, certain uh, elements uh, on the far right who believe that the FBI is trying to stage a coup and undermine the legitimate uh, institutions in the United States. So Russia swoops in and takes advantage of this, and they do so very well and very easily and very effectively. And we saw this in, in the 2016 election, and we're seeing it now uh, play out. So the, these three issues uh, of good governance, of economic freedom, and, and, and uh, trust in uh, law enforcement and security services, uh, these uh, help build resilience. And most of the policy competencies to allow for the focus on these three issues do lie with the nation state. Uh, but there are issues uh, and areas that the European Union and NATO do need to focus on, especially as it pertains to the countries of the Eastern Partnership region. I would say that both of them must have uh, a credible open door and they must have meaningful relations. And by this, I mean, for the countries in the Eastern Partnership who genuinely want to join these institutions, there has to genuinely be a door open for them. But not every country in the Eastern Partnership aspires to be part of the Euro-Atlantic community in a formal and official way. And I think we need to do a better job at acknowledging this and building our relations with these countries outside the context of future membership. Um, and I think if we do this and we could have a, we could have more um, credible and meaningful relations with, uh, with these countries. And specifically though, um, Russia has per perfected uh, the perfect formula to prevent a country 
from Euro-Atlantic integration, whether it's membership of the EU or membership of NATO. Russia knows that all it has to do is invade and partially occupy a country. And then right now, that is the end of their Euro-Atlantic aspirations in practical terms. And I really think that both institutions have to get creative with how they can bring countries into these institutions, even with uh, these very complex geopolitical situations on the ground. One example that I've written quite a bit on is with, in the case of Georgia with uh, occupied Shkin Valley and Abkhazia regions, uh, where, the, where NATO could um, uh, allow Georgia to join the alliance, uh, but amend Article 6 of the North Atlantic Treaty to um, exclude the occupied regions uh, from the Article 5 protection. So it's a little complicated there, but Article 6 of the North Atlantic Treaty is the article that defines where Article 5 applies. Uh, there are plenty of examples um, inside NATO where there's a member of NATO that doesn't have all of their territory covered under Article 5 or uh, under Article 5. Um, the U.S. and Guam, the U.S. and Hawaii, uh, the, the Brits and the Falkland Islands, for example, uh, France and Reunion Island. So th there are many examples where there are countries inside NATO that not all of their territory is um, protected by Article 5. And the reason why this would work in the case of Georgia and not in the case of Ukraine is because Georgia has a stated uh, non-use of force pledge. So if the if the Georgian government doesn't need uh, doesn't need to use military force to get the regions back, then why would they want an Article 5 security guarantee um, for these two regions? So that's why this specific case would would work uh, in the case of Georgia right now, but not necessarily Ukraine. I only bring this one example up as uh, as a idea for these institutions, whether it's the EU or NATO, to think creatively on how to bring these countries across the finish line. Um, and I'm happy to discuss this specific case in, in more detail if anyone is interested in the Q&A. In terms of the United States and what we can do, um, I think that there are three areas that the U.S. can focus on when we look at resilience uh, in the Eastern Partnership region, uh, especially as we look at economic recovery in the post-COVID-19 era. Um, the first one is, and, and the administration has already been really good on this, but the first one is the Three Cs initiative, uh, really doubling down and focusing on making this initiative um, uh, grow some legs and, and to get running. Uh, the, there is going to be a uh, Three Cs Initiative uh, Summit in October. Um, if it's not, ha perhaps it's already been rescheduled. Um, uh, Ambassador Eker, yeah, he's postponed. shaking his head. Postponed. Okay. Well, uh, someday we will have this Three Cs Summit, uh, God willing. <laughs> and th this next summit will be a crucial one, I believe. I think uh, we've had a few years of, of hard legwork to get the Three Cs Initiative up and running. And this next summit, I think, could be an opportunity to really drive it forward. And the U.S. has a, a role to play here. And the U.S. has played a very positive role. And the second is on energy security. Um, in my opinion, uh, and I would say this, but Nord Stream 2 uh, should be dead right now. Um, the, the, the issue with Navalny being poisoned should have been the final nail in the coffin. I'm hoping it will be the final nail in the coffin. And the U.S. needs to play more of an active role helping and encouraging Europe to look south. Um, the Southern Gas Corridor is uh, coming fully online in November. Um, there's a huge potential to offset a lot of what Nord Stream 2 would have brought in to Europe in terms of natural gas. The U.S. needs to play a bigger role. Um, I, I, admittedly, this is going a little further than the Eastern Partnership geographically, but the U.S. needs to play a, a leading uh, role on encouraging the Trans-Caspian gas pipeline and getting the Azerbaijanis and the Turkmens to come around the table and discuss how uh, this can be realized. And this could tap into the Southern Gas Corridor and bring even more natural gas to Europe. Um, and uh, we need to understand that while the U.S. might not have a direct financial interest in projects like the Southern Gas Corridor or even a Trans-Caspian gas pipeline, the U.S. also had limited uh, financial and economic interests in the baku tbilisi Cheon pipeline in the 90s. But the, but the uh, Clinton administration still really pushed for this 
and gave it like that U.S. seal of approval, stamp of approval, which I think helped with other international investors to get involved. And then finally, um, the, the third area is on the 5G issue. I think there's been good progress uh, on this, um, and the, you know, this ties into China and resilience, and I think the United States needs to continue to be uh, more involved with our European partners to show some of these countries in the Eastern Partnership region that there can be alternatives to Huawei and China 5G. So um, I'll end there, and uh, I look forward to our comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Luke. I'm now going to open the floor to um, questions, so to speak. I have a couple of um, typed up questions here. Um, so I'm going to start with those. The first one is to um, Ambassador Rika and Richard uh, Tibbles. Um, and it's asking about the situation in the Donbass um, and what would your opinion be on the so-called inspections of Ukrainian position on the front line by pro-Russian militants, as Mr. Kozak recently insisted during the Minsk contact group meeting. Um, can this proposal be considered as an attempt to, to legalize um, Russian uh, mercenaries? Just typing down. As a side of negotiations, what kind of reaction um, can be expected on this? And that question is from Dmitro uh, Shurko. So if you'd like to start with, with that, maybe you first, um, um, Ambassador. Sure, I, I think uh, you're referring to the uh, advisors meeting of the, the uh, uh, Normandy Four uh, political advisors that met in Berlin, I think on, on Friday. I don't think there was any new ground yeah. there. What we see is the continuing uh, efforts to resist uh, meeting the commitments that were taken under the Minsk uh, agreements. Um, that's what we have uh, stood for and supported in, in terms of uh, the work of uh, Germany, France, uh, working with uh, Russia and Ukraine on that. Uh, there's a continued effort on the Russian side to disassemble uh, and move away from the responsibilities they have. Uh, they undertook very clearly uh, in joining the Minsk Accords uh, those responsibilities. Uh, and, and that's what uh, we would call for. Uh, again, we, we stand by, uh, maintain very close uh, contacts uh, with all the parties uh, here, uh, and it's simply a matter of meeting their commitments. Uh, I think it's uh, crucial to remember that this is an ongoing uh, conflict. It doesn't get the attention that it did as we get distracted by so many other things, but this was perpetrated uh, by Russia. Uh, they undertook this. They are uh, under uh, strong sanctions from the European Union, from the United States and others because of that. Those sanctions have been continuously uh, rolled over. Uh, and of course, we would love to be able to remove those sanctions when they meet the commitments uh, that they, they pledge for. I don't know if Richard wants to add anything from the EU side. Uh, we keep in close contact uh, with our EU colleagues on this too. Thank you. Um, Richard? Richard Tibbles? He, he was, he was the, the, the questionnaire was asking for an EU response as well. I think we missed, you, you may be on mute, Richard. Sorry, the, for some reason I got uh, turned off there. Um, I'm on now. Okay. Yes, okay? Yes, good. Just two, two points in addition to what Phil said. Firstly, what progress there has been over the past year or so is due to President Zelensky and his uh, colleagues. Uh, this should not be forgotten. Um, we have constantly called now that it is time for Russia to reciprocate these moves by uh, Ukraine to make progress and to do that in a genuine way. And unfortunately, what we are seeing is that the moves by Russia are designed to portray it as a mediator in the conflict as opposed to a party. And as Phil said, uh, uh, it is a party to the conflict uh, and it is time for Russia to fulfill its commitments under the Minsk agreements. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have a second question here from Yaroslav um, Musko, um, who's asking what kind of scenario for Belarus do you expect after the meeting between um, President Putin um, and Mr. Lukashenko? 
Um, I don't know, Luke, would you like to take this? <laughs> well, I, I probably have the most flexibility uh, to, to get crazy with my response than the, the two officials from the, the EU and State Department. No, it's, you know, it's always uh, very dangerous as a think tank analyst to make these sort of like, predictions, especially, you know, when things are being live streamed and recorded, because you often get them wrong. Um, and then you're constantly reminded of it. But uh, I, I think uh, everyone was expecting the sort of like big bang um, with Belarus uh, after the uh, fraudulent elections. And I always thought it was going to be a slow burning fuse um, with so civil unrest building up and, and eventually getting to a tipping point where Lukashenko um, becomes at his rock bottom weakest where he becomes more the most vulnerable, not only to civil society, but also to Putin. And then Putin comes in to rescue him. And then Lukashenko is in, um, indebted to Putin even more um, in this scenario. And I think we're seeing this slowly play out. Um, I'm not sure what's gonna come uh, immediately uh, from uh, the aftermath of the meeting that's taking place uh, today in Sochi, but I do uh, suspect that um, some sort of uh, arrangement uh, is being discussed uh, between Russia and Belarus, whether this means a, a union, full union state now or, or what, I don't know. But without a doubt, um, the two leaders are conspiring on how to um, not necessarily keep Lukashenko in power, but how to ensure that Putin maintains his level of influence in Belarus uh, and maintains Russian interests. Uh, so um, I, that's probably not a satisfactory answer for the person asking the question because I kind of just rambled on because I don't have a, a crystal ball. <laughs> but uh, I, I basically, I don't think we're gonna see um, things develop quickly. I think, again, this is going to be drawn out weeks, if not months. Great, thank you. Now we have a hand up from um, Yuri um, Shiko. Um, if my colleague could unmute him, that would be great. Mr. Shiko, you, are are you there? there? You're self-muted. You need to unmute yourself, sir. Okay. And do you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank yes. you very much uh, for an interesting discussion. I have uh, two questions, but first it's rather um, uh, to what Richard said uh, after when he talked to a representative of one partner country saying that it's very difficult to translate resilience. Uh, the problem is actually much bigger. As a journalist, I can tell that it's not only I mean, I still do not know how to translate it uh, really into Ukrainian and Russian, but the problem is that it is even more difficult to sell it to the broader public. Because as a keyword, resilience, uh, if you put it, uh, it kills uh, practically almost no one clicks on this, uh, uh, on the title with resilience. So uh, I understand that you bureaucrats are great at inventing some new buzzwords, but uh, Maybe uh, it's also as a question, maybe you would like to think how to sell them to the broader public, because I'm sure that you are interested in public discussing and knowing about this topic. And the second question also probably to you, um, these uh, initiatives of increasing resilience of Azov region and what also the EU, the CU package of increasing resilience of Azov region. So. Can you say what are the results of uh, of this um, of these efforts? Have you seen really improvement uh, on the ground there? Many thanks. Should I come in? Yes, go ahead, Richard. Um, thanks very much. No, I agree that the language problem extends to the ability to sell the concept in the Eastern Partnership. Um, I think that we in the the way we're going to sell it is by concrete actions I think and that's why the uh, uh, joint communication talks about sustainable economies improving the rule of law environmental and climate change actions digital actions and inclusive societies in other words we will have to explain the concept of resilience by what we do on the ground with our partners by concrete actions I think that's the best 
that's my best uh, that's my best uh, response on that. On the Azov, it's still it's still uh, relatively early days to talk about uh, uh, results. As you know, we have the kind of project office now established in in Mariupol. In addition to that, our uh, European Union advisory mission is going to be setting up a field office in Mariupol as well. So, I mean, I think what we have done already is, if you like, um, um, uh, demonstrated our presence on the ground. And, and that, I think, is an important first step. Now, the projects in terms of uh, economic development, that will take longer to come in, but we're working on that with uh, the uh, EIB uh, and EBRD in, in, in particular. But I think having a presence on the ground in that sensitive area is, is not uh, unimportant. Oh, just can I just say on uh, Belarus, I don't want to go to uh, just one comment. I don't think the genie can be put back into the bottle. I think the people have seen so much violence following the stealing of their votes that this means that a return to the status quo ante is not possible. So I don't know what kind of transformation or transition there's going to be, but certainly uh, the uh, we, I think we've all been we've all been so so impressed by uh, the determination of the Belarusian people to. Uh, demonstrate for their basic uh, human rights. Amanda, can I uh, add on to what Richard just said? Yes, because absolutely. I do want to echo that. And again, uh, uh, we have been working closely with the, the European Union and other partners uh, because we all have the same goal, that is uh, to recognize and, and underscore the importance of uh, Belarus sovereignty and the right of the Belarusian people uh, to have a government that delivers for them. and and. Apropos the the question and the um, the comments Luke made uh, in terms of today's uh, Sochi meeting, I mean I just echo what Deputy Secretary Began said uh, on Friday in, in some uh, comments uh, to the press. It, it really eludes us how Moscow can back a regime that is carrying out such violence uh, against its own people, peaceful citizens who are exercising constitutionally protected rights uh, uh, for, for freedom of assembly, association, for speech. And, and let's remember that the Belarusian people uh, see Russia uh, as a country closest to their hearts uh, outside of their own. They want their own sovereignty, as they have made very clear, but um, their choice and sentiments uh, to have a friendly, positive relationship with Russia is there. And I don't know why uh, Vladimir Putin would want to uh, to jeopardize that if if the Kremlin continues down a path of supporting a regime uh, that will not perform and and uh, deliver for its own people, it risks turning the Belarusian people, I think, uh, uh, against uh, uh, Russian. They they will uh, lose the very positive views that they have. Uh, so why would Moscow? Uh, support such a regime uh, remains a question, and I think it's an appropriate question to ask today. Thank you to you both. Um, I have a hand raised from uh, Mr. Roland uh, Gajoni, and I apologize if I pronounced your family name incorrectly. Um, are you there, sir? Roland? Okay. He has, okay, um, he's also actually um, typed in his question, so I'm going to, to read it. It's a question to Ambassador Rika and to um, you, Richard uh, Giragosian. Um, it's about Russia. How do you see Russia's move to sell weapons to both Armenia and Azerbaijan? Is this mostly done due to financial self-interest to, to seal as much weapons as possible? Or do you think there are larger geopolitical interests of fomenting renewed conflict and first arguing, aug augmenting Russia's role in the region? So would you like to answer that first, Ambassador? Sure. I mean, I think uh, I don't want to get too far into uh, to, to make any broad speculations on that. But just to recall that uh, Russia is a partner with us and with France in the, the Minsk process under OSCE uh, to find a peaceful resolution to the long term conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh. That process uh, has been successful in maintaining 
uh, piece there an important channel for discussions. And uh, we have taken that very seriously. And so any efforts that would disrupt uh, balances within the region uh, or promote uh, potentially efforts to resolve uh, the conflict in a, a non-peaceful way, we would not uh, support. So without speculating as to geopolitical motives, I would just turn to the, the structures and the institutions that we have uh, that while not being able to find a, a resolution yet to the conflict have been important and continue to be uh, in providing opportunities uh, for the dialogue that is ultimately <laughs> necessary. Um, Richard? Yeah, let me jump down? in now. Are you still there? I'm going, to, I'm going to be less diplomatic because uh, fortunately I'm not an ambassador. Uh, I'm a fellow Richard, but I don't have the bureaucratic restraint. Luke and I actually have been looking at the conflict for a long time. And I do think the emergence in recent years of Russia as the primary supplier of weapons to all sides of this conflict is not just destructive, but detrimental. Moreover, I think a lot of the escalation that we see since 2016, especially, but even recently this past July, uh, we have been witnessing a rather uh, upward escalation or trajectory that it's very hard for all parties to the conflict to climb back down. And I do worry about the most recent arms shipments, which is focused on supporting and bolstering air power. And from a military perspective, this is especially troubling because we have not seen the air component of, of escalation. And I do think the advanced offensive weapons are actually going to undoubtedly increase the cost in lives from this so-called frozen but now kinetic conflict. And I do think it's more than financial. I think it's the ultimate leverage for Russia over both Armenia and Azerbaijan. And if there's one winner from this conflict, it's clearly Moscow. It's certainly not Armenia, Azerbaijan, or Nagorno-Karabakh. And I do think that we need to reinforce and reiterate the informal arms moratorium to all, that, are, that has been imposed by the OSCE. Now, having said that, I also think the MINS group is doing the best it can, given the lack of political will. And unfortunately, I think there's a much greater willingness to use these offensive weapon systems, making it probably even more dangerous. And I do think that Russia, even as it takes the diplomatic initiative, is playing a rather duplicitous game. It's rather disingenuous, to be quite honest. Um, in the Armenian perspective, however, it shows the new challenge for Armenia, the challenge of an unreliable so-called security provider, which has contributed to a further escalation of a crisis with Russia, which geopolitically is perhaps a, a belated recognition in Armenia and Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh that Russia has become part of the problem and much less part of the solution. But, I mean, Richard, hasn't that been the case for years? I mean, we've been hearing for many years that, you know, Russia um, is part of the problem. It's been supplying arms to both sides um, for years. Um, that nothing, nothing actually changed. Does this, does this also reflect the fact that there isn't that much interest um, from other key actors around the world in this conflict? I mean, no, it seems I would, to be a I see it a little of Russia, but not to the West. I see it a little differently in that all of us on this panel, especially because I know everyone, uh, we all understand and recognize that Russia has been part of the problem. However, in the Armenian public opinion, in the mainstream Azerbaijani public space, this is a belated but very determined and conscious recognition that Russia is a key, but in a negative sense. And I think that's what's new about this. 
there is much less Armenian reliance and trust in Russia as it once was, especially with the change of government. So I do think that although there's no easy way to climb down or climb back from the brink, I, I do think the parties to the conflict themselves have a more realistic appraisal of who can help and who can hurt. Thank you. Um, we have one more question um, with the green hand up. It's from Tanya Meleska. Meleska. Um, is she still there? Tanya, are you still there? I'm still here. Thank you. Um, my name is Tanya Meleska. I work for the Macedonia News Agency. I have a question for uh, Mr. Ricker. Uh, I will um, just want to take you a bit uh, further south. I'm sorry, it's not completely on the topic, but since you know North, North Macedonia very well, um, uh, how do you assess the threat, the Russian threat in North Macedonia now that it has become a member of NATO? Do you do you um, do you think that the country is now safe from Russian influence at this point, or safer, or and if not, why? Uh, and of course, if if, if you can um, give a more general comment on on the post-election uh, situation in North Macedonia. Thank you. Well, I'll just be very brief uh, as we wrap up. Uh, again, it, it encapsulates the, the broader issue that we faced, and that is uh, Russian malign influence uh, continues to be uh, pervasive and a challenge uh, in NATO member countries, uh, as well as those that are not part of uh, the alliance. We see it here in the United States, where they continue to, to try to uh, meddle in our uh, elections and, and other malign activities. Uh, that was the case in North Macedonia, but the North Macedonian uh, system, the, the constitution, the process has been resilient in that sense. I think the elections were a positive signal uh, that the democracy in the country remains uh, alive and well. It was a, a free and fair, uh, well-conducted election that uh, demonstrated a, a desire to continue with the momentum that was made. That included uh, North Macedonia becoming the 30th member of NATO uh, despite the challenges uh, of COVID-19, uh, that was a major uh, development uh, for the alliance, but also obviously for, for North Macedonia, for the broader region uh, this past spring. We need to remain vigilant and all work together uh, in, in dealing and, and uh, first of all being aware of and then trying to combat Russian uh, malign activities. Uh, and I have every confidence that the new government in North Macedonia uh, will continue to to uh, to work uh, uh, to better the country uh, and focus on uh, uh, stronger international relations. The security and stability that's provided by the NATO membership uh, will help lead to uh, more opportunities for greater prosperity. And again, we see that long-term conflicts like that between North Macedonia and Greece can be resolved through pragmatic uh, diplomacy and efforts uh, that the PRESPA agreement demonstrated and allow us to move on uh, for, for better opportunities regionally. So thanks very much. I have to drop off and be at my next uh, uh, platform, but in a different room in, uh, in one minute. So uh, Amanda and everybody and colleagues, uh, thanks very much. Great to see you all today. Thank you very much, Ambassador, uh, for joining us today. Um, we, we actually, before we close the meeting, I would just like to ask one final question actually to Veronica, because it just came to my mind. In a few weeks, Ukraine will have local elections. Um, how important are these going to be for a test um, of Ukraine's, you know, again, in resilience in terms of, you know, um, democracy and um, free elections and whatnot? Can I just, before uh, Veronica answers, can I just sign off as well? I've got another meeting to go to now as well. Thanks very much, uh, uh, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Richard. And returning to Ukrainian elections, indeed, it will be very important uh, and in a couple of dimensions. On the first, it will be elections based on a completely new election code and uh, so called open party list. Uh, proportional elections on open party lists. It, is, uh, it has been fighting for for many years. Uh, as far as I understand, the version that we have now, it might not be perfect. There are people who are saying it's great, people saying that it's incomplete, but it 
is <coughs> at least it's it's move in this direction but it means that the election bulletins will be very complicated and it might be a lot of complaints delays in uh, calculations and as a result a lot of uh, suspicions around that it's on the one side on the other side we have a problem that the political uh, fight is very strong uh, party, the ruling party, Slugan Naroda, the servants of people, they are losing their support. Uh, they are not as low as it was like Poroshenko in the fifth year of his term, but basically the level of support the party enjoyed a year ago is definitely gone. And we will see in how how they will go through local elections. It's a lot of unconfirmed uh, information that the, they try to use the administrative power to convince some uh, popular local people to go under their brand uh, with the use of like pressures and criminal cases if they are not really willing. I'm not sure that it's, it's approved, but uh, that's what uh, you read in the news. So I don't know, it might be fake, but that's what we hear at least it's, it's a discussion around uh, we have a party of uh, they call the party of majors but it's a party of local elites new party formed that are actively campaigning in large cities they just explicitly say that they are against current national level that did not support them properly with uh, the covid fight um so it will be it will be very interesting elections. It will show clearly two things. It will show, or maybe even three. It will show whether Ukraine managed to keep the tradition of democratic elections, because basically, after Orange Revolution two thousand four, we have had always fairly democratic elections, more and more democratic. Yanukovych gone without elections, but basically, it he won. He won elections. That was true victory. That so we'll see how how it will behave. And one risk that quarantine, if it will be quarantine, how they will organize elections in quarantine because the cases of COVID in Ukraine is growing strongly. Uh, the second is definitely the civility, democracy, uh, this uh, the how these party lists will work. Because if it will not work, the people might say let let's keep it all together. And the third is the support of the ruling party, and as a result, the ability of the ruling party to do reforms, if any, or with whom it will cooperate after election. So it will be really crucial, although it's still local. Okay, thank you very much, um, Veronica. I think we all have our fingers crossed that it will go well. Um, EPC will certainly be organizing an event around the elections. Um, but we've ended our time, so I'd really like to thank all of our speakers um, for coming and give us, giving us a fascinating um, discussion on enhancing resilience and security uh, in Eastern Europe. I think we covered many issues within that issue. It's certainly a theme that the EPC will be continuing um, to follow. We do a lot of work on the Eastern Partnership region. Um, I'd like to thank again the cooperation um, with the US mission to the EU. It's always great uh, to work with you. So thanks again to all of our speakers. Thanks to the audience. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on another occasion. So good afternoon to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon.